हेलो गाइस दिस इज़ दी लेक्चर ऑफ जीएसटी अमेंडमेंट फॉर दो स्टूडेंट्स हु आर नॉट एबल टू अंडरस्टैंड हिंदी सो देर आर लॉट ऑफ स्टूडेंट्स फ्रॉम साउथ इंडिया एंड दो स्टूडेंट्स रिक्वेस्टेड मी टू रिकॉर्ड ए पर्टिकुलर अमेंडमेंट लेक्चर इन इंग्लिश एज वेल सो इफ़ यू कैन अंडरस्टैंड हिंदी एंड इफ़ यू आर कम्फर्टेबल इन हिंदी लैंग्वेज यू विल फाइंड आउट दी जी एस टी अमेंडमेंट लेक्चर इन लेक्चर इन हिंदी एज वेल बट इफ़ यू आर नॉट कम्फर्टेबल विद हिंदी then uh, i am also recording this lecture in which i will be covering all the gst amendments for ca final ca inter for ca may final ca may inter for cs executive for cs professional in complete english language so if you are only comfortable with english language then i will i will suggest you to watch this lecture i will uh, suggest you to continue this lecture if you are comfortable in hindi you can also watch another gst amendment lecture which is already uploaded in which i have used english language that is mixed language so it's a complete english lecture of gst amendment and uh, the sheet what i am using right now is basically a uh, icai updates institute of chartered accountants of india update but basically these updates are applicable for all exams whether it is ca cs or cma it doesn't matter this update will be useful for all the students so you can download these notes from the uh, link in the description below you will find out the link and you can download this sheet uh, now we are starting with all the amendments uh, there are not uh, i can i can say there are not that much amendment that it will require more than 2 to 3 hours to cover this uh, uh, sheet so we will be covering all the amendments in approximately 45 minutes to 1 hour okay so for the next 1 hour you have to sit tight because uh, these amendments are very important for the purpose of exam uh, all the institutes whether it is icai or icsi or icmai they always love to ask amendments in the exam okay so we are starting and we are starting with the first amendment and that amendment is actually in supply chapter what is the amendment i can say it's more like a clarification uh, there is a clause that says that if a society is uh, providing any services is giving any services any goods to the members then there is always a question whether it is a supply or not so before july 17 there was some other kind of provision regarding this point after july 17 there were a lot of amendments i am just clarifying that what is exactly uh, the current position of the law so as per the current position of the law if the society or any body of individual any unincorporated body of individual any association if they are providing goods and services to the members in exchange of any consideration then of course it is a supply under gst so whether gst will be livable yes of course gst will be livable it will be considered as supply so for example in tarak mehta ka ulta chashma if gokul dham society is uh, providing services to their members like there are lot of cooperative societies they are uh, supplying goods to their members whether they are also covered in gst or not yes that is a taxable supply they are covered under gst law their supply will be treated as supply under section 7 and they will be chargeable with gst even that amid this amendment says that these two person who society and the members they are two distinctive person they are two deemed separate person they are two separate person and that's why the supply between them will be treated as supply under section 7 and the gst will be livable that is the first clarification i can say it's not an amendment it's more like a clarification what is the second amendment second amendment is actually in charge of gst chapter basically in composition scheme if you remember in composition scheme there is a ineligible list in which there is one notified manufacturer ice cream tobacco and pan masala on which gst uh, composition scheme is not eligible okay so in that list two or three names are uh, recently added and what are these names these are the names on the screen fly ash bricks bricks of fossil meals and similar siliceous earth building bricks and roofing tiles all these are the additions to the list of ineligibility in the composition scheme so if there is a notified manufacturer he is manufacturing pan masala tobacco ice cream cigarettes he is manufacturing fly ash bricks he is manufacturing siliceous earth fossil meals bricks or he is manufacturing any roofing tiles or building bricks 
then he is not eligible for composition scheme so there are some addition in the list of the goods which are ineligible as a notified manufacturer is uh, ineligible for, for these goods uh, this is the second important amendment okay what is the third amendment now the amendments are in exemption list if you remember uh, there is a uh, government that is central government state government local authority okay or government entity or government authorities they are doing any municipality or panchayat function for that they are using any pure labor or works contract service then it is exempt it is already discussed in the class that if the government is receiving any services relating to pure labor or work contract for the purpose of the function under municipality in panchayat act then that service was completely exempt sir now whether this this uh, exemption is abolished no there is only a small change that these two names are now eliminated what are these two names government authority and government entity so if these services are used by the central government by the state government by the union territory by the local authority then this exemption will continue to prevail this exemption will be eliminated only for two entities like government authority and government entity like airport authority of india port authority of india any government entity if they are doing any panchayat or uh, any panchayat or municipality function and for that purpose if they are uh, using any kind of uh, labor contract or works contract services then they are taxable they are not exempt so only two names are eliminated from the exemption so if the government central government state government or local authority is using these services these are exempt but if these services are used by the government authority in the government entity then they are taxable this is the second important amendment in ex uh, in uh, exemption chapter two amendments first one is pure labor and second one is works contract both are exactly same both uh, in both the amendments these two names are eliminated next important amendment this is again very important if you remember in our class or maybe in the revision lecture i have discussed about the passenger transport and goods transport services yes we are right now talking about the exemptions in passenger transport services if you remember there are lot of exemptions in passenger transport services like uh, if you are embarking or terminating your journey from uh, northeast states then you are uh, eligible for exemption second exemption was non ac buses non ac taxis except tourism and charter if there is any non ac bus non ac taxi that is also exempt there was one there was another exemption like non ac railway coaches are exempt metro monorail tramway inland waterway public transport metered cab and auto rickshaws these are all exempt now what is the amendment listen very carefully this amendment is applicable only for this this and this yes so listen very carefully non ac contract carriage except radio taxi non ac contract carriage means non ac taxis stage carriage other than ac means non ac buses so non ac buses and non ac taxis and metered cab and auto rickshaws for these three if you are booking your ticket through any e commerce website then the ticket will be taxable even if it is non ac bus yeah what is the clause listen very carefully if i am booking any ticket for non ac bus i am booking any auto rickshaw i am booking any metered cab or i am booking any non ac taxi from any online platform any e commerce operator then there will be no exemption so if i am booking directly like i am uh, 
I am uh, asking any metered cab to stop and he will just start the meter and stop the meter where my journey will end he will charge me the ticket as per the meter he will charge me the fare as per the meter that is exempt I am not talking about that but if you are booking any auto rickshaw like we can book uh, auto rickshaw from Ola and Uber as well so if I am booking any auto rickshaw if I am booking any metered cab if I am booking any bus ticket non AC bus ticket if I am booking any uh, non AC taxis then they will not be exempted if I am booking through any online platform like if I am booking any ticket from red bus so whether I am uh, uh, booking AC ticket or non AC ticket it will be taxable if I am booking any ticket from PTM whether it's AC ticket or non AC ticket it will be taxable so the important thing is it will be taxable and the interesting thing is taxable under 95 so the liability or to pay tax is not on us not on the supplier the liability to pay tax is ultimately on the e-commerce operator so that service is also covered in 9.5 so what is the final conclusion of this exemption actually students asked me in the class as well so like sir if I am booking any taxi from the Ola Uber that will be radio taxi and that will be taxable but what if I am booking any auto rickshaw from the Ola Uber so that time when the doubt was asked I was completely silent you know why because even I don't know what was the current what was this existing situation but now the situation is almost clear they clearly specified that if you are booking any auto rickshaw from the online platform now it will be taxable and taxable in the hands of the e-commerce operator so 9.5 will be applicable in this case so that is the another important uh, elimination from that amendment from the exemption next there is one more change what is the change uh, if you remember when the government is availing any services of insurance and training and the complete burden of that service complete burden of the expense is on government then that is completely exempt that is given in uh, heading in our notes when I was teaching you I put in heading services received by the government yes services to the government in that heading there is an exemption that if I if the government is bearing any insurance or training expense hundred percent expenses are borne by the government then it is completely exempt now there is an um, change what is the change if government is bearing any expense of training of 75 percent or more whether it is central government state government or union territory if the government is receiving any services and the burden is more than 75 percent on the government like uh, government is ready to give training to the unskilled workers and they are ready to bear 100% expense it is exempt they are ready to bear 80% expense it is also exempt but if the government is bearing only 50% expense 50% ex remaining 50% will be paid by the person government will only bear 50% of the training expense then that service will not be exempt the service will be exempt only if the burden of uh, expense on the government is 75% or more so the slight change in the exemption is before that exemption exemption will be available only if 100% expense borne by the government now that 100% has been changed to 75% so if the 75% of the expense is be borne by the government now that service will be exempt minimum 75% burden should be on government for the training now again the important point is it is not for the insurance for the insurance the clause is almost same 100% expense to be borne by the government but for the training even if the 75% expenses are borne by the government that's enough that that's enough for the exemption they will give you the exemption now there is one new exemption and that exemption is for all India truck permit so if there is any goods carriage goods carriage means I can say truck and there may be a uh, department of the government road transport department or maybe some kind of department who are issuing national permit for the truck so in that case if any person is issuing national permit for the truck then that particular entity is exempt whether it may be the road transport department maybe the uh, central government any other ministry of uh, road any any department if they are issuing national permit for a truck so that they can carry out the goods in India or maybe in some contiguous states then that is completely exempt but again the point is it should be national permit 
this exemption is not for the state permit so if you are asking any state government for the state permit then that is not exempt exemption is only when it is for the national permit by the truck okay that is also an important exemption one exemption is actually omitted i have already discussed that in class again i will repeat this exemption uh, now this is omitted indian railway financial corporation is actually giving services to indian railway of leasing that was the exemption before 2022 now this exemption is eliminated means now if indian railway financial corporation is leasing assets to the indian railway that service will be taxable irfc sir how i remember this name because recently i think 6 uh, month back maybe like one year back there was an ip of of irfc indian railway financial corporation so that company what is the business of that company they are leasing assets to the indian railway so now whether that business will be taxable of course so if irfc is leasing assets to the indian railway now it is not exempt it is completely taxable it will be taxable and uh, there will be no exemption of that these are the amendments in the exemption chapter moving towards the another chapter next amendment is in itc i have already discussed this amendment in the class i have already discussed this amendment in the cma sessions i have discussed this amendment uh, uh, i am i am basically teaching this amendment for the last 6 months and what is this amendment before 2021 before january 21 if in my gstr 2a 2b itc reflected is 1 lakh i can claim itc up to 5% extra of what is reflected in uh, gstr 2a 2b so that was the clause the clause was very simple that how much itc reflected in uh, gstr 2a 2b if some invoice is missing then you can claim extra itc only up to 5% of the auto populate itc in gstr 2a 2b that was the clause before january 22 but after january 22 now the clause is very clear it says if you are itc in gstr 2b is 1 lakh in 3b you can only claim itc up to 1 lakh rupees it means if your invoice is missing your seller basically he doesn't file the return or he misses your invoices and because of that in your gstr 2a 2b that detail was not auto populated now can i claim the itc of that invoice no you cannot claim the itc of that invoice means uh, you have to wait till the seller uploaded that invoice in gstr 1 or maybe using the iff facility if he is not able to upload the invoice in gstr 1 then you cannot claim itc on that this is again very important amendment that is regarding uh, you cannot claim any itc other than which is auto populated in gstr 2b so if your invoices are not uploaded by the seller your invoices are missing you cannot claim itc only on the basis of invoice your invoice should be reflected in gstr 2b if it is not reflected in gstr 2b you cannot claim itc of that invoice before january 2022 uh, the rate which uh, i can claim the itc excess of what is auto populated in 2b by 5% now that 5% has been uh, eliminated and now i cannot claim any itc if my invoice is missing and it is not reflected in 2a to b i cannot claim itc of that even if i am having the physical possession of the invoice you cannot claim itc until or unless it is reflected in 2a and 2b this is again very important amendment you have to remember this next amendment is again in registration chapter very simple amendment this amendment is basically related to aadhar authentication so if you remember when we were discussing the registration chapter i have told you that uh, aadhar authentication is compulsory okay uh, means a proprietor partnership firm a partners karta in huf trustees in uh, trust or md or directors in company they are required to verify their aadhar number while applying for registration now 
there was an option that you can apply for registration without Aadhaar. But important thing is, if you want to revoke your cancellation, if you want to file refund application and you want to claim any refund of tax, then without Aadhaar authentication, the department will not allow you to apply for revocation, to apply for refund. So even if you have applied for GSTN number without Aadhaar authentication, you have to undergo this Aadhaar authentication if you want to claim any refund, if you want to apply for the revocation, they will not permit any revocation without the Aadhaar authentication. So while applying for registration, I can apply for registration without Aadhaar authentication. The procedure will be a little different. If I am applying for registration with Aadhaar authentication, then the officer will revert within seven days. If I am applying for registration without Aadhaar authentication, then the officer will revert within 30 days. If you remember, in case of uh, applying without Aadhaar authentication, officer can also physically uh, verify your premises. So you have granted registration number without Aadhaar authentication, but you cannot claim any refund. You cannot ask for the revocation of cancellation without Aadhaar authentication. So it is very important that for revocation, for refund, for claiming IGST refund, Aadhaar authentication is compulsory. If now I am applying for Aadhaar authentication, but the problem is my Aadhaar number is not assigned to me till now. I have some problem in my Aadhaar number and I have applied for the Aadhaar, new Aadhaar card because there was some change in Aadhaar number or maybe I am applying for new Aadhaar number. The point is, till that, can I claim refund? For that, the department says, if your Aadhaar is pending, your Aadhaar number is under processing, then during that period, you can claim the refund. For that, what you have to do is, you have to furnish your Aadhaar enrollment ID. Like when I am applying for Aadhaar number, na, they will give me Aadhaar enrollment ID, my application number of Aadhaar. With that, I have to apply an address proof like bank, passbook with photograph, voter identity, passport or driving license. Even when my Aadhaar number is under processing, even when my Aadhaar number is not yet assigned to me, they will issue me the refund, they will allow me to apply for revocation if I have my enrollment ID, I have applied for Aadhaar number, that is enough, that, but within 30 days, you have to update your Aadhaar number as well. So once you are applying for the refund, you are applying for the revocation with the help of Aadhaar enrollment ID. Now what I have to do is, within 30 days, I have to uh, apply, I have to uh, authenticate my Aadhaar as well. So it's basically a temporary permission that while your Aadhaar is under processing, you can apply for uh, refund, you can apply for revocation. In that case, you will go with our Aadhaar enrollment ID and you have to attach your identity as well, like bank passbook with photograph, like voter ID, passport or driving license. These are your photo IDs. So you have to attach that photo IDs as well. That is also possible. That is regarding Aadhaar authentication. Another amendment is again very interesting. Another amendment talks about uh, registration threshold limit. If you remember, in section 22, there were three, four different threshold limit like 10 lakh, 10 lakh, 20 lakh, 20 lakh. And the, for uh, all the other states, the threshold limit was 20 lakh, 40 lakh, if you remember. And in that 20 lakh, 40 lakh, I have told you that pan masala, tobacco and ice cream, the limit of 40 lakh is not applicable, limit of 20 lakh is applicable. Do you remember that? I have told you that for tobacco, for pan masala, for ice cream, for cigarettes, lower limit is applicable, upper limit is not applicable. In that list, again, the few names are added. These names were added in composition scheme as well. Now these names are exactly again added in registration as well. So with the ice cream, pan masala and tobacco product, again we have to add these names in registration chapter as well. So this amendment is in composition as well as in registration because in composition notified manufacturer of these goods cannot apply for composition. In registration chapter, these notified goods, if you are dealing in these goods, then you, lower limit will be applicable. Limit of 20 lakh will be applicable. Limit of 40 lakh will not be applicable. So in that list, few names are added. What are these names? Again, I am repeating those names. Flash bricks, uh, bricks and fossil uh, meals and silicious earth. 
building bricks and roofing tiles these are the goods which are again added in registration chapter relating to the lower limit applicability of lower limit applicability of upper limit is not applicable in these kind of goods this is again important sir what is the third amendment in registration chapter another amendment is also very important what is this amendment about listen very carefully uh, before this amendment if my registration got cancelled because of the sumoto cancellation by the officer like officer thinks that i am doing any kind of fraud or maybe i am not uh, filing the return officer cancelled my gst number so i only have one option left that i can apply for revocation and i have to apply within how many days if you remember the limit was only 30 days the problem is there was no extension so what if i cannot file the revocation within 30 days maybe because of some uncontrollable circumstances because on some emergency reason it is not possible for me it was not possible for me to file the revocation within 30 days and now the time has gone what can i do now actually now the law allows extension of revocation application extension of time period in revocation application so before this amendment i can apply revocation only within 30 days from the order now from the cancellation order now i got an option to extend that time limit as well so further extension of 30 days is permissible by assistant commissioner or deputy comm assistant commissioner or joint commissioner and for further 30 days extension you have to apply to the commissioner so now i can apply for revocation application within 30 days but if i am not able if i fails to file within 30 days because of some reasonable cause then additional commissioner may permit me 30 days extension and commissioner can further permit me 30 days extension so with extension now i can apply for revocation within 90 days not 30 days this is another important amendment next amendment is in tax invoice debit notes and ev bill very simple i have discussed a lot about e invoicing in your lectures i have told you that for those entities whose turnover in 1718 is more than 50 crores e invoicing is compulsory now the limit is reduced to 20 crore and from october 22 now that limit will be reduced to 10 crore so what government is doing they are applic uh, they are applying invoice e invoicing phase wise so they started with 500 cr and they will stop until they reduce the limit to 5 cr so they will they started with 500 cr then they reduce it to 50 cr then 20 cr and from october 22 it will be 10 cr but for your exams for november 22 and december 22 exam 20 crore limit will be applicable so if your turnover from 2017 till now if in any year in any year if your turnover exceeds 20 crore then e invoicing is applicable for b2b invoices listen very carefully again this is phase wise so now e invoicing is only for b2b invoices so if you are issuing b2b invoices in your aggregate turnover in any of the preceding year from 17 till now if it is more than 20 crore uh, then basically e invoicing is applicable for you so this is the amendment the turnover limit has been reduced from 50 crore to 20 crore rupees in your module maybe it was it was given as 500 crore or 50 crore please change it now the limit of e invoicing is 20 crore if your turnover in the preceding year in any of the year is uh, more than 20 crore then e invoicing is applicable another important amendment again is e invoicing uh, e invoicing was not applicable for says insurance company banking company transport companies passenger transport companies and multiplexes two more names are added in this list government department and local authority so now says insurance bank passenger transport goods transport multiplexes government department and local authority are not required to issue any kind of e invoicing so e invoicing provisions are not applicable for all these entity now two names are included in these list that is the government department local authority for all these names e invoicing provisions are not applicable they are not required to issue e invoices this is another amendment next amendment is in dynamic qr code 
first of all you have to understand what is dynamic QR code I have discussed that in the class but I will let you one more time I will explain you one more time what is dynamic QR code so first of all it is applicable for those companies whose aggregate turnover in any of the preceding year from 17 18 till now is more than 500 crores and it is only applicable for B2C invoices yes what is dynamic QR code basically government want that if there are big companies like uh, telecom companies or broadband companies or insurance companies or banking companies or maybe many many other companies they are providing like uh, they are providing business to consumer services okay so but their turnover is more than 500 crore 1000 crore 2000 crore maybe I don't know how much so when they are issuing the invoice what, what they have to do is they have to put a QR code on their invoice as well and when the customer will scan that QR code automatically uh, the amount will be auto feeded and he just have to uh, put his pin the amount will be directly paid so to promote digital payment to promote UPI payments what the government does is they impose the provision of dynamic QR code on those companies whose turnover in the any of the year from 17 18 till now is more than 500 crores for those companies dynamic QR code is compulsory but it is only applicable for B2C invoice B2B it is not mandatory because if business to business uh, transaction is there the payment will automatically be paid by the bank or the uh, tra digital payment will be there but if B2C transaction is there then to promote the digital payment the government imposed this provision that you have to put a QR code on the invoice and that QR code is dynamic so when you will be scanning that QR code automatically the amount will be auto feeded you just have to put your pin and the amount will be deducted from your account so to promote the digital payment the government imposed this provision to apply to paste dynamic QR code on your invoice so now what is the amendment amendment is very simple I have just told you that dynamic QR code is only applicable for B2C yeah I just told you that dynamic QR code is only applicable for B2C users yes now the point is very interesting sir if I am issuing any invoice if I am issuing any invoice to UIN holder UIN holder you know what is UIN holder embassies and UN bodies bodies that is called UIN holder so if you are issuing any invoice to the UIN holders whether that will be covered in B2C transaction or B2B transaction that is the question and that is the clarification that was issued in this amendment basically UIN holders are not registered under GST they have the UIN number not the GSTIN number and the purpose of the UIN number is just to claim the refund so yes selling to UIN holder is a B2C transaction and if I am selling it to UIN holder then it will be covered under B2C transaction and dynamic QR code is mandatory so that is the clause that if I am selling it to the UIN holder then it will be considered as B2C transaction and dynamic QR code is mandatory in this case next important amendment it is for eBay bill listen carefully there was a new rule attached to eBay bill rules that rule is called 138 E what that rule says that if you are you are defaulting in your returns if you have not filed the GST returns for the last two months or the two consecutive quarters then they will block your eBay bill facility that was given in rule 138 E that blockage is like that that if I am selling something I cannot pre prepare the eBay bill if I am purchasing something even in that case nobody can prepare eBay bill for me as well because my eBay bill facility is blocked so if I am selling something I cannot prepare the eBay bill if I am purchasing something eBay bill cannot be prepared in my name that was the clause under rule 138 E so the blockage is not only on the sale the blockage is on also on the purchase now the rule clarifies that no the blockage is only on sale so if the seller the third party from whom I am buying the goods if he wants to prepare eBay bill in my name then of course he can prepare the eBay bill before this amendment he cannot prepare the eBay bill in my name it means I even I cannot purchase the goods if my eBay bill facility uh, is blocked but now this rule says I cannot sell the goods 
of course i can purchase the goods but i cannot sell the goods if my evil facility is blocked so what 138e says it says that uh, blocking of gst and eva bill is only in respect of any outward supplier eva bill can be generated in respect of the inward supplier received by the registered person so eva bill can be generated for the inward supplier but if my eva bill was blocked because i have not filed the last two consecutive returns then eva bill will be blocked for my outward supplier but not for the inward supplier that is again very important rule 138e next amendment is in uh, payment of taxes a uh, very basic and very simple thing i told you what i tell you what is the provision there is a rule rule 86a that says that if the officer has reasonable belief that the itc available in the electronic ledger has been fraudulently availed or is ineligible then the department may not allow debit of the amount equivalent to such credit in the electronic ledger it means your credit will be blocked the department will block your credit if they if they feels that there is a reasonable belief that itc was fraudulently availed now the question arises is what is the meaning of reasonable belief for the department even having a slight doubt is a reasonable belief but that is not the right option even having a slight doubt cannot block your itc because if the officer is blocking your itc means your crores of crores of itc has been blocked so you have to pay your all the taxes in cash only that is not justified with the tax fair it is unjustifiable with the tax fair and that's why what the provision says reasonable belief doesn't means there is a slight doubt they have given the grounds that what is the what is the reasonable belief means when the officer can block your itc so the first reason for which they can block your itc under rule 86a is they can block your itc if the supplier from whom you bought the goods is non existent or he is not conducting the uh, business from his place of business means the person from whom you bought the goods the person whose invoice you are uh, from uh, on the basis of which you are availing the itc that person is not existing means it might be a bogus company it might be a bogus seller now there is no seller no company and you want to claim the itc the department will not allow you any itc because the seller the invoice is bogus because that person is bogus uh, who prepared the invoice second he has the invoice but he actually doesn't receive the goods in itc chapter there was section 16 and that section 16 clearly says that you cannot avail the itc if you have not received the goods so might be there is some bogus invoice you purchase invoice from something and you didn't bought the goods you just purchase a bogus invoice and on the basis of which you are claiming the itc you will not get the itc department will block your itc third is the credit is availed by the registered person on invoice on which the tax has been not been paid by the government means if you are claiming the itc and the tax was not paid by the seller like your to be doesn't reflect that invoice i have already told you that provision in itc amendment as well that if in your to be it is not reflected then you cannot claim a itc and if you have claimed the itc and department believe that you are claiming the itc on which tax had not yet been paid the department will block your itc so as per rule 86a the department will block your itc if the tax is not paid by the seller to the government for such invoice so it should be reflected in your to be if not you cannot claim itc next the registered person claiming the credit is found to be non existence the person who is claiming the credit is bogus like i am claiming the credit and now i i don't have the business i am not doing the business from the place of the business the department will block my credit ledger because now the department know that that person is fraud he is not at the place of the business he has fraudulently claimed the itc department will block my itc and finally the credit is availed by the registered person without having invoice he doesn't have the invoice 
who gives you the right to claim the ITC if you don't have the tax paying document? Section 16 says you can claim ITC only if you have a possession of tax paying document. So if you don't have the tax paying document, if you don't have the invoice, you cannot claim ITC on that. That is again very important point. So these are the grounds. If the department believes that you are not, uh, you have claimed ITC without invoice, without receiving the goods, bogus seller, bogus invoice or bogus receiver then in all these cases your ITC will be blocked this is again important amendment A next amendment is in the last chapter that is return and what is the amendment they have changed the late fees so amendment is regarding late fees and one more is regarding reconciliation first I will tell you what is the late fees if you remember the late fees for GSTR 1 and 2B, 3B and 4 was 100 rupees per day or uh, 5000 whichever is lower per act. So for SGST it was 100 rupees per, act, per day or 5000 whichever is lower for uh, CGST again 100 rupees per day or 5000 whichever is lower. Now 100 rupees per day is intact that 100 per rupees per day is intact that doesn't change the limit of 5000 is now different before this amendment it was clear that whether my turnover is 1 crore whether my return was nil the maximum late fees was 5000 per return per act now this has changed what is the change it, uh, it depends on the turnover and the return as well so what is the difference listen if I am filing the nil GSTR 1 or GSTR 3B, nil, then the maximum late fee per act is 250 only. 250, only 250. So 100 rupees per day or maximum late fee is 250 per day, 250, uh, whichever is lower. So if I am filing nil return, my late fee will not exceed 500 rupees in total. 250 for CGST and 250 for SGST. But if I am not filing the nil return, and my turnover is less than 1.5 CR. So my return is not nil and my turnover is less than 1.5 CR then it will be 1000 rupees per return. Maximum penalty is 100 rupees per day or 1000 whichever is lower. So if my turnover is uh, less than 1.5 CR, 1000 rupees per act. So for both the act it will be 2000. If my turnover is more than 1.5 CR but less than 5 CR, so the limit will be 2500 rupees per per act so maximum 5000 and if my turnover is more than 5 CR then late fee will be uh, 10,000 5000 per act so it will be intact same as it was given in section 47 when the turnover is more than uh, 5 CR but if the turnover is less than 5 CR then the late fee maximum late fee will be reduced to 2500 if my turnover is less than 1.5 CR then the maximum late fee will be reduced to only 1000 and whatever my turnover is if I am filing the return uh, my return is nil then the maximum late fee only 500 rupees only 500 250 plus 250 okay this is for 1 and 3b sir what about 4 what about the composition dealer basically composition dealer will be covered here only because their turnover is not more than 1.5 CR so for composition dealer if the return is uh, nil then 250 and if the return is not nil then 1000 composition dealer will not be covered here because their turnover cannot exceed 1.5 CR so of course they will be covered in this or might be this so this is for the composition if their return is nil then maximum 250 per act so both the act to 500 if their return is not nil so of course it will be less than 1.5 cr so 1000 rupees per act so for both the act it will be 2000 so that is the change in the late fee the change is not the in the per day late fee the change is in the maximum late fee it is 5000 for more than 5 cr for 5 cr 1.5 cr it will be 2500 for less than 1.5 cr it will be 1000 and for nil return it will be 250 per act so multiply by 2 for both the act getting it 100 rupees per day is intact it will be intact for all the returns so that is not uh, change the change is in maximum late fee the last and final amendment is in reconciliation what is the clause listen carefully as per section 44 when I am filing the annual return and if my turnover is more than 2 crores I was required for GST audit which is certified by 
and uh, GST audit in which I have to attach a reconciliation statement which is certified by chartered accountant or cost accountants. So before this amendment, there was a certification required by chartered accountant or cost accountant of the reconciliation statement. But now, the reconciliation statement which I will be attaching with my annual return if my turnover is more than 2 CR. CA or CMA certificate is not mandatory now. So basically they kicked out on our stomach. This amendment kicked out our stomach because, because we lost a signing power here. So automatically we lost a chance of getting a fee from the client as well. So in this case, reconciliation statement that he will be attaching in the annual return is not required to be certified by CA. It m might be self-certified. So now even the taxpayer can self certify that I am uh, certifying that my books of accounts and the data I am filing in the return are reconciled. The books and the return data are reconciled. For this now they don't need CA certification or CMA certification. Now it can be certified on self self certification basis. So the taxpayer will automatically uh, will uh, certify. I hereby declare that the information given by me in the reconciliation statement attached my me is uh, true and correct and I uh, certify that statement or the taxpayer will sign automatically. That is the certification. They don't need the certification of the uh, they don't need the certification of the CA or the CMA. That is an interesting clause regarding reconciliation amendment. And with that, these are the amendments up to section number 50. So what about the amendments after section 50? First of all, for CA inter and CMA inter. Uh, the syllabus is only up to section 50. So for, tho for uh, all those students who are in CA inter, CS executive or CMA inter, these uh, exemptions are sufficient. For CA final and uh, CMA final, I think the remaining amendments are not that much. So uh, amendments in the offense penalties are not that much, very, very few amendments are there. So I think you can do that by yourself only. Uh, you can get the final am amendments from the ICI website as well. So these are the amendments for all the levels for all the students, whether it is CA, CS and CMA. Again, I am saying this whole lecture is in English. If you want to hear the Hindi lecture as well, they, there are, uh, I have also uploaded that lecture about GST amendment in normal language. This is this lecture is completely in English. So I hope uh, this lecture is basically for South India students. There are a lot of students from South, from Kerala, from Tamil Nadu, from uh, Karnataka. They, they were asking me to record the lecture in English. So this is a lecture for those students. Thank you. Enjoy. Good day. I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I hope you are able to understand the lecture. Good day. Bye-bye. Thank you.